John Germain Memorial Library today. We have a really special event. My name is Wanda Miller. I'm the assistant director here, and I'm really thrilled to introduce Richard Hart. He's a Steinbeck scholar, and he's here to give us a talk about, um, of course, John Steinbeck, a really wonderful part of his community in the past. So welcome and enjoy, and thank you, Richard. You're quite welcome. So let me also, uh, is that going to be too loud? Now uh, let me also thank everyone for all of you for coming out today. It's a brisk afternoon and uh, holiday season is upon us, so I'm sure you've got plenty of other things you could be doing with your time today, so I appreciate very much for your game. I have to admit that uh, this is a larger audience than I've had occasionally for Steinbeck talks that I've given in various places around the world. Very nice, uh, numerically speaking, I'm sure quality-wise also, uh, to see this, this group of people. Uh, I'm a, uh, a retired philosophy professor, so I'm not a, a lit specialist or a lit crit uh, person. I'm a philosopher, and uh, that has been my mode of entree into uh, John Steinbeck. I might also add that uh, sometimes when I've given philosophy talks at conferences and conventions, I've had much, much smaller audiences. <laughs> In fact, I remember once uh, giving a talk I had prepared long and hard at the American Philosophical Association meeting in Chicago, and um, I showed up for my, my meeting, and there was absolutely no one in the room. But I went ahead and delivered the lecture, <laughs> and wrote it onto my curriculum vino when I got back to my college. So I'm a credit for this, because I prepared, <laughs> even though there was nobody there to hear about it. Was in any case, uh, I want to thank Wanda and her colleagues here at, uh, at the library for the honor of being invited to participate in this sort of 50th anniversary celebration of, of Steinbeck's passing in 1868. It is really a great pleasure, and uh, I've always enjoyed my time here in Sag Harbor, and this is kind of a culminating event in some ways uh, for me. So I really appreciate that, uh, that Wanda reached out to me some months ago, and we were able to, uh, to work out this, uh, this event. So just curiously, how many of you would regard yourselves as avid Steinbeck readers? Just by a show of hands? Good. Um, those who are not avid readers have at least had some, some exposure to Steinbeck over the years, right? And uh, I'm just curious, how many of you might have had some brush with uh, John Steinbeck when he lived here? Oh, that's, that's terrific. That's one of the great regrets of my life is that I didn't move from the Midwest to the East Coast until uh, after Steinbeck had passed away, unfortunately, so I never got a chance to meet him. Um, Okay. As I said, I uh, am a philosopher, so some of what I'm going to talk about today will have to do with uh, philosophy, Steinbeck and philosophy. I have a rather provocative title, a favorite or the favorite uh, writer, many love to hate. And so uh, that will be my burden today to kind of lay that out, is what I mean by that. We all know that John Steinbeck was a, a, that he loved stories. He absolutely adored stories. In fact, it's reported that early in his writing career, when he was really trying to establish himself, and he would go around hanging out in bars and, you know, in farm fields and uh, the sugar factory and so forth out in California, he would actually pay people uh, to tell him a story from their life. Not very much money, because he didn't have much money in those days, but uh, he would actually make a small payment if somebody could give him a really good story that uh, he thought maybe he could spin into a short story later on. So he really loved stories, and of course we know that he was a great teller of stories. So today I intend to tell a Steinbeck story, but a little bit of a different one, a story of his, uh, his career, if you will, or 
his reception within the literary community in particular. So it's kind of a career story. This is a story of pathos and drama, deceit and conceit, bias and suffering, triumph over adversity, callous elitism, and what I'll call natural human caring. It's a story of humor and extraordinary irony and paradox. I think the story that I hope to tell would be best captured perhaps as, quote, a near perfect example of a catch-22 in the history of American letters. Now we know what a catch-22 means. In fact, Joseph Heller, who was a writer out here on the East End, coined this phrase, right? made it famous, right? The idea of no way out, right? You're in a trap. Uh, you're, you're squeezed in, in such a fashion that uh, you can't win by doing, or you can't win by not doing. And I think maybe by the time I'm finished, I hope I will have convinced you that that's the exact squeeze and trap that John Steinbeck found himself in. So it's a near perfect example of a catch-22 in American letters. Well, all of this kind of sounds a bit like a story right out of the Steinbeck Ovoir, right? We could have found uh, his fictional Ovoir. We could have found uh, something of this drama and pathos and of mice and men or grapes of wrath or The Pearl, or any number of other works. I think this story is, uh, is encapsulated in the title of my talk, so let me just say a few words about each of the carefully selected words in the title. Uh, favorite, the favorite. So favorite would suggest popular. Very popular, very well received, very well read. Writer. Why did I choose the word writer instead of author? Because Steinbeck has been known to say over and over again, I don't even know what an author is. I'm certainly not an author. He said, I'm a writer. I write. I get up in the morning and I write. So it would be uh, <coughs> not appropriate for him to call him an author. Many love to hate. So who are the many? And what are their reasons? That's a lot of what I want to try to explain today. And of course, love to hate Love is, of course, a strong emotion, very powerful, very passionate. Uh, and indeed, his critics were quite eager and passionate about their criticisms. And of course, hate is just the opposite uh, emotion, if you will. Uh, the desire to castigate, to condemn, to bring down. So each of the words are kind of carefully uh, selected. A large amount of credit uh, that I must offer uh, goes to Jackson Benson, who is the primary uh, biographer of John Steinbeck, Jackson J. Benson, a big, thick book from John Steinbeck, uh, writer. And many of these ideas uh, I got from, from him, so I can't lay original claim to any of them, necessarily, or at least not to all of them. So, Philosophers are accustomed to making bold assertions, so I'm going to start with a bold claim. Namely, that when we consider John Steinbeck's life and his art, it is at the very least arguable, in fact, I'm pretty convinced of this argument, that no other major American writer, I underscore the word major, not a minor writer, but no other major American writer ever has been so maligned so willfully misunderstood and abused, so often made a victim of other people's expectations and other people's agendas, no other writer subject to this in such a measure as John Steinbeck. So here today, I hope to lay out the case for you, perhaps a bit like a defense attorney might do in the courtroom. What is the evidence? Uh, in fact, I've got a couple of exhibits here to, to show you in just a few moments. Um, is, is this evidence true or false? Is it supportable or not? To be affirmed or to be rebutted, or maybe a little bit of both? Um, we don't want to be purists about this today. I mean, uh, Steinbeck had his warts just like everyone else and his shortcomings, so it maybe is a little dash of both with respect to the evidence that I'll cite. So basically, how do we account for the nearly unbelievable irony and paradox in the case of John Steinbeck? Let's start with some examples of, of the hatred or the dislike, if you will. 
Um, some of them are humorous, some maybe not quite so humorous, but we'll just start with a few. So I'm going to start with a, a cemetery incident that occurred out in uh, Salinas. This comes from an article that Jack Benson uh, published a few years ago. There was a woman named Pauline Pearson who lived in, in Salinas. This goes back now about 15 years or so. I'm sure she probably has passed away at this point. But she worked with the John Steinbeck Library there in Salinas, taping interviews and doing all sorts of things. And she would give uh, tours of the town to people who would come and want to find out more about the author's life and his death and his burial and so forth. So she began, uh, at one point she had a group of people and she began to give a talk about the author's death and burial. They had actually gone to the cemetery and they were standing in front of the Hamilton family plot and she was beginning her talk about the death and the burial and after just a few minutes, right in the middle of her presentation, the sprinklers suddenly came on <laughs> all around the group, surrounding the group, everybody getting totally wet. Some grounds creeper, a groundskeeper, excuse me, according to Benson, some groundskeeper was apparently registering his protest that John Steinbeck should be revered in this way by outsiders. Just a little bit more from this, uh, this piece by Benson about the mixed reaction to one of our most popular authors. Curiously, even though there were embarrassing moments like the one just cited, as we know, uh, people seem to relate to Steinbeck in a way, very personally and very emotionally, that they don't relate necessarily to other authors. So he was a writer not only who created these memorable stories, but someone who really seemed to care a lot about people, particularly unfortunate people, the dispossessed, those who are persecuted. This quality of the writer uh, was remembered by a guy named Herbert Hendricks. Hendricks, excuse me. Uh, he was a boyhood friend out in Salinas of John Steinbeck. One of the very few people uh, at this point in time that remained in, in Salinas that remembered Steinbeck. As a boy, he recalls, this is Herbert Hendricks. If John could talk you into doing something, he delighted in that, especially if it got you into trouble. You wouldn't think John could show compassion at all. He was surly. He never really laughed, but he was always there to help somebody. He was always standing up for this one boy that the other kids constantly picked on. One day I asked John why, and he said, quote, when you're down, someone's got to help you. That was John. I've never forgotten that, Henry says. And then Benson writes, it's the genuineness of this caring that he demonstrates throughout his life and throughout all of his work, and that I think is a secret to his enduring appeal. So there's the cemetery incident. Let me cite a couple of other things. As we know, works like The Grapes of Wrath and Of Mice and Men to this very day remain among the most commonly banned books from schools and public libraries, not the Germain Library, thanks, <laughs> thankfully, but schools and libraries throughout the country, throughout the United States. Uh, ironic that, in fact, middle school and high school kids are sometimes assigned, say, for example, of Mice and Men or The Pearl to read, and yet their own public libraries ban these books for all the reasons that are probably obvious to you. In fact, uh, early on in his life, uh, many of Steinbeck's books were literally burned on the steps of the library in Salinas, just a few blocks down from the house where he grew up. They were literally burned. We'll get into some of this uh, in just a few moments. So that's the second point regarding the banning of his books. Uh, a third example. Just a day or two after the 1962 announcement of Steinbeck's winning of the Nobel Prize for Literature, it was a major editorial that appeared in the New York Times. I believe it was Arthur Meisner, who was the author of this op-ed. The essence of it was to condemn the decision by the Nobel Committee to select John Steinbeck. And the essence of it was, how in the world? What, are these people out of their minds? 
How in the world did they give this honor to somebody who was just a regional writer from the 1930s? Right, that was it. In one decade, that was it. Uh, someone who was a 10 freight philosopher, whatever that would mean. Uh, a one trick pony, he basically just had one story to tell and after that it was all downhill. These criticisms are some of the hints at what we're going to be getting at here in just uh, a few moments. I would also add, as an academic, uh, I think it is absolutely the case that if one were to teach at a so-called Research One University, an R1 University, that's a place, you know, like Ivy League schools, but also very prominent uh, public and uh, private institutions. Uh, if you taught there, say, in American literature, and you taught Steinbeck, or if you focused your research and your scholarship on John Steinbeck, I think there's little doubt that you would never be promoted or awarded tenure. Um, Steinbeck has not been embraced by the academic community. In fact, if you just propose the idea in, you know, at Yale or at Columbia or someplace like this of, of seriously studying John Steinbeck, one's colleagues would turn their back on you, no doubt. All right, so the question becomes, who are all of these haters and why? What would their reasons be? What are their beefs against John Steinbeck? Their reasons. Are those reasons defensible or indefensible? Well, Hart says largely indefensible. I would say no, no. And all of this points up the fact that what we're dealing with is nothing but a terribly ironic and paradoxical situation of the whole shebang, if you will. Steinbeck, as we know, is much beloved by millions of readers around the world. He is very popular. Indeed, that may be part of the problem. In fact, that's one of the things I'm going to, to cite. All of his books, to my knowledge, all of his books, at the time of his death, 26 volumes, are still in print. There are translations of his works all over the world. Scholarly studies and secondary literature is growing as we speak. I have some exhibits to show. There's, for example, the National Steinbeck Center now in Salinas. Now, this would have been unthinkable decades ago, right? But this is, if you've never visited there, it's a really wonderful place to go, right? We've got a newsletter that they put out. Susan Chillingall is a former director, a good friend of mine, and she's spoken here at Caneo several times. Um, there's the Steinbeck Review, which is a periodical that comes out focused just on Steinbeck work, right? Great articles appear in here. Once in a while, they have a piece of mine in there. Um, just uh, from my travels around the world, translations, for example, uh, two translations of *Of Mice and Men*, one from Italy, one from Romania. Right. And here is a uh, a scholarly study by a good friend in Japan, Kiyoshi Nakayama who we met, my wife and I met, uh, on a trip through Japan. Uh, virtually all of Steinbeck's works are translated into Japanese. And in this particular uh, volume, Professor Nakayama um, does a kind of book-by-book, -book, major book-by-book -book study of each one of the books. And he gives the background of Steinbeck, he gives his family history, tells about his time here in Sag Harbor. In fact, I can't read a word of this because I don't understand any Japanese. But I put a marker in here where there are little tiny photographs of his cottage here in Sag Harbor, as well as the writing studio, Joyous Guard, out by the point, right? In fact, Kiyoshi gave me a, a photograph from the, of the writing studio that he took when he visited here once, after Steinbeck's death. I think I have it in the bathroom at home, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just point out one other thing. So, Exhibit A, Of Mice and Men. See this skinny little book? I mean, this little novelette, it wasn't even called a full-scale novel. It was called uh, sort of a novelette, right? Or a novella of sorts, right? This little book has generated an enormous amount of commentary, books, articles, and so forth. This being the latest book that I know of that has come out. Strictly critical reactions to Of Mice and Men, with an incredible array of, of scholars in there. I have a chapter in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm the best company, but uh, 
just amazing that a tiny little book like this could generate such reaction, which all attest to the popularity. Now, it is true that there have not been as many academic theses and dissertations written on Steinbeck as would be the case with, say, Faulkner or Hemingway. It's hard to get a figure, uh, get a handle on the numbers. The Steinbeck estate, as well as his publishers, have been very stingy about giving out uh, the number of how many copies have sold each year and so forth. But some estimates going back 10 or 15 years would suggest that maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 copies of Grapes of Wrath alone are sold around the world each year, in various translations, of course. Um, that's pretty amazing when you consider then that all the other writings are still in print as well. So could all of this be at least part of what has garnered so much negative reaction? This is the big question. So let's tackle this enigma, this irony, this paradoxical situation, if you will. As I've noted already, the haters were not and are not chiefly everyday readers, people like us. Uh, young people, many young people really adore the Steinbeck stories, like the Red Pony, for example, or the Pearl. So it's not these people, it's not those who are lovers of good literature and grand tales. The haters really are a group, I would characterize them as almost a small army, of professionals, quote unquote, professionals in the literary world, critics, scholars, professors, journalists, editorialists, political types. And then if I were to be a little tongue in cheek, I might throw in perhaps jealous literary agents, <coughs> jealous publishers, or jealous fellow writers. That's just my little dash of humor. But actually, all of this taken together becomes something like the anti-Steinbeck cabal, as far as I can see. And this has been going on you know, for years and years, and persists right up to this moment in time. So what are their basic problems with Steinbeck? and his writings. I have eight arguments, if you will, or claims. They're not really arguments, they're claims that are made in the literature and in the critical reaction. Let's take them one through eight. They're not organized in any particular priority, except I do want to really stress and emphasize the last one, because that's the big one. That's the granddaddy of them all, the politics part. But we'll get to that. That's also where it becomes very relevant to our present times. So, first of all, John Steinbeck was a Western. He was a Western, California. Thereby, at that time, at the time of his writings in that uh, location, his experience was regarded primarily by East Coast evaluators. The experience in the West was very limited, very regional, had no universal or lasting value. The West was perceived as a kind of wild, rugged, uncultivated place with no long and deep history like we have here in the East. In short, the West was perceived as just the opposite of the East Coast. The East Coast being the Mecca, the intelligentsia. Consider New York City as a cultural and academic center along with places like Boston, Philadelphia, right? The Ivy League, major newspapers and periodicals, of course, published right here in our area, in New York. So this, if you will, this whole East Coast literary establishment was regarded as setting the standards, establishing the standards of literary taste and acceptability. And their rather consistent claim was that the so-called California experience does not ever lead to Class A literature. Just can't be. Almost by definition, it was an oxymoron, if you will, as far as these people were concerned. So, that's the first point. He was a Westerner, thereby just a regionalist. Couldn't possibly be a more broad-based author or writer with universal appeal. Second point. Steinbeck was very popular, as we've already pointed out. Now, this is a kind of silly bias. But it is quite prevalent in literary and the academic worlds. And popularity can be perceived as the kiss of death. So in the world of philosophy, for example, 
um, a philosopher, a trained philosopher who writes books that are accessible to the intelligent public and really get people stirred up and make them think and read it. They're castigated within the academic community. How could they possibly sell lots of copies of their books, but really the only philosophical treatises that are of worth is the, those that are so dense that only about a half a dozen people around the world can even figure out what it means. So, the idea of popularity is often seen as a negative mark. If you're popular, you can't be very serious, you can't be very good. Uh, that is, you simply have mass appeal. You are uh, capitalizing on the least common denominator, so to speak, among the reading public. It is often said that for a writer to be deemed really important, she must have one great, memorable, best-selling book, but if she has a series of them, <laughs> then the suspicions begin to arise. I think closely related to this, this claim about popularity is the notion that Steinbeck was an overly sentimental writer. I think this is largely a false claim, although not altogether true. He had his sentimental moments. But the idea of being sentimental, that's a kiss of death, too, you see, in, in the literary community. Because then you're considered to just be wishy-washy, overly emotional, um, again, appealing to the, the masses. The critics, the scholars, condemn those who are so-called sentimental writers. Third, Steinbeck wrote stories that had humor in them. Semi-comedies like, like Cannery Row and farces like Burning Bright. He also wrote allegories. An allegory you know, has multiple layers of interpretive possibility and meaning and are often mysterious. Steinbeck once said about Cannery Row, I wrote the book on four different levels and there hasn't been a critic yet that has figured it out. <laughs> I'll be honest, I haven't figured out all four levels either. I maybe get two, possibly three levels, but I'm not sure I've reached that level of the fourth uh, in Cannery Row. But, you know, that, that complexity really befuddled a lot, of, a lot of critics. And the fact that he was funny, if you read Cannery Row, it is just a stitch. I mean, consider the frog hunting scene, for example, in Cannery Row, both in the movie version as well as the written text. It is hilarious. And of course, the claim is, well, you know, if you're funny, geez, I mean, you're like Mark Twain, you know, you're, you can't really be serious. Like Twain, Steinbeck wrote for the people. But for many people in the so-called professional community, a writer must be elite, must be sophisticated, and if you will, a highbrow of a certain sort. Many of those folks never forgave Steinbeck for leaving his beloved farm realism, his agricultural realism in California, and they never forgave him for experimenting with stories that are indeed allegorical. Consider Canary Row, consider the gopher parable that comes at the end, for example. The gopher parable. Suddenly a gopher appears, right? A Mr. and Mrs. Gopher. And it's a parable, right? Well, a lot of the experts didn't want to deal with that. Fourth point, Steinbeck was forever an experimentalist in style, in genre, and in the themes that he chose to write about. The thing about Steinbeck is that he refused, I put this in capital letters, he refused to ever write the same book over again. This became a big problem for him. His critics, I imagine his publishers, indeed I know some of his friends, wanted him to just keep on writing about the Long Valley, the Central Valley of California. Keep on writing about farm laborers and their struggles, right? In other words, to keep repeating by a formula, if you will, the enormous success of Grapes of Wrath. And I just want to note here parenthetically, I'm sure you're well aware, but it's almost impossible, it's almost impossible to overstate the, uh, the enormity of the impact of Grapes of Wrath when it appeared, right, in the 1930s. The, in that depression era. I mean, the enormity was just, it, it almost was, it shook society, American society at its core, right? Here's a guy who's telling the truth in realistic fashion about what it's like, you know, to be a farm laborer, what it was like for those Okies and the like. I mean, 
the U.S. was shaken right to its, its core. So, and it was enormously popular. I mean, on the best-selling list for God knows how long, and uh, Reader's Digest Book Club, the Pulitzer Prize, I mean, you name it, it got everything. Uh, FDR was very impressed by it, as was his wife. Um, just an enormous amount of success, so there was tremendous pressure to just keep on writing in that mode. Right? Keep right on going. Keep everybody happy. But he would not do it. Steinbeck always sought something new. As we are aware, he wrote plays, he wrote novelettes, he did screenplays for films, he prepared texts for documentaries, he wrote farce, he wrote travelogues, like Travels with Charlie, Charlie yeah. right? Which got its origin right here in San Barbara. He did war reportage, we'll talk about that a bit later. In other words, he was always experimenting with different themes, different genres, different modes. He did not ever want to repeat himself. He thought that would be too easy. It would be like cheating, you know? You come up with this magic formula that sells tons of books, you just keep repeating it. You know, that's the way it is, the pulp fiction that you find at the end of the drugstore counter, right? Or at uh, the uh, you know, shopping mall or the grocery store. Uh, these people are enormously wealthy, but they've got basic, one basic formula and they just keep churning it out again and again and again and again, and again with different characters and different storylines. Steinbeck hated that. That was not what it meant to be a literary artist. Okay, number five. Steinbeck wrote virtually no literary criticism himself. No serious literary essays or scholarly articles, although he was clearly capable of having done so. Extremely brilliant man. But he didn't, uh, he didn't cater in that kind of, of work. He didn't write uh, critiques of his fellow writers. Uh, he, he talked very little about, about that. Which meant, of course, that he was not really embraced within sort of the community of, of writers. He never really was one to reach out in this way to the professional, literary, or academic establishment. As many of you probably know, because of your brushes with uh, Steinbeck here in San Harbor, he was a very shy man, extremely shy, quite, uh, quite an introverted person, self-effacing. He never liked to speak about himself. He was never a self-promoter. Now imagine this, right? If you're a writer, say, in today's world, right? You want to make a stink out of yourself, right? And you're not a self-promoter. Steinbeck rarely gave interviews. In fact, to my knowledge, there's only one, one little skinny book about the size of, of Mice and Men of interviews, of collected interviews that he gave throughout an entire writing career. He never would speak about himself. He hated public speaking. In fact, it would nearly make him ill to stand before an audience like I'm doing today and speak about himself or about his work. He was very, very nervous about that. As I understand it, in fact, someone out here years ago told me that uh, upon announcement of the Nobel Prize, uh, some of his pals out here had to actually convince him, persuade, kind of force him into attending the ceremony uh, to accept the Nobel Prize because it means that he would have to give a speech. And it's a damn good speech, by the way. It's an excellent speech. If you've ever read it, it's one of the best in Nobel literature history. But it was not his thing. <coughs> Clearly Steinbeck would not have made it in today's Oprah Book Club culture. <laughs> Steinbeck was an intellectual, but absent the credentials. You probably all know about how he dropped in and out of Stanford University as a young man, never did get a degree. Never did. Studied only the things that he wanted to study, namely marine biology and writing. Yeah. And as far as taking all those other required distribution courses and the like, that wasn't his cup of tea. But he was indeed an intellectual. But at, even as an intellectual, he was deeply suspicious of what he sometimes referred to as the suit and tie crowd. I think that would include me. Um, he was a nonconformist, an outsider who always went his own way. On that suit and tie point, I've often wondered, since I've done a good deal of talking and writing about Steinbeck over the years, if he would have approved. And I'm not so sure he would have. A uh, group of philosophers getting together and talking about his work, or... I'm not so sure. He gave no readings, he didn't do talk shows, he didn't do book tours, he probably would have literally hated 
the literary world of today. All right, point six. Somewhat ironic, perhaps. Steinbeck was a man of ideas, big ideas, grand ideas. He was indeed, in many ways, a philosopher, and that's, of course, one of the reasons that I love him. Uh, he was a tremendous stylist, in my view, in his best work. Not in all of his work, but in his best work. A great, great writer and stylist. Uh, a terrific, imaginative thinker. And to my mind, there's a level of spirituality in Steinbeck's work that is often not as appreciated as it should have been. But here is a man of great ideas, of spirituality, of stylist, and so, and yet he's condemned for his philosophy. People like names that you'll re remember: Edmund Wilson, Alfred Kayes, and Arthur Meisner would make claims such as he's nothing more than a tenth-rate philosopher doing tenth-rate philosophizing. I've always tried to figure out what that would mean. I mean, I'm a philosopher. I dedicated my entire life to being a philosopher. I know what a second-rate. <laughs> or a third-rate philosopher might be. What the hell would a tenth-rate philosopher be? I mean, that, somebody who uh, failed their first course as an undergraduate, I suppose. But that's, they said that about him. I mean, that's actually in print. They also uh, alleged that he was uh, a, a very amateurish, kind of vague biologist. This biologism in his work was really very vague. Uh, Pseudo-philosophizing, they said. He engaged in pseudo-philosophizing. His philosophy is not worth bothering with. And on top of that, there's just too much allegory, too many multiple layers, too much confusion. And lastly, especially uh, in maybe the second half of his career, too much moralizing. Too much moralizing. Critics didn't like that. To me, that's one of his most endearing qualities, but we'll talk about that in just a few moments as well. Closely related to his being a philosopher. What sort of a philosopher? Well, it can be explained in many ways, but one thing that I would want to highlight is that he was an ecologist. Steinbeck was an ecologist, along with his buddy Ed Ricketts, the marine scientist Ed Ricketts, Cannery Row, right, Knox Laboratory. He was well before, back in the, the, the 20s and 30s, well before we even had the language of ecology, before scientists were paying any real attention to it. Uh, here was Steinbeck and Ricketts out there proclaiming, you know, how important it was that we recognize the interrelatedness of all in all, of man in nature, the importance of cooperation and understanding of our role as humans in human nature. If we were to spend just a moment thinking about the situation today, and the environmental catastrophe that is on our doorstep. They were actually thinking about this and even making predictions of this decades ago, decades ago. But again, uh, the scientists at the time didn't take ecology very seriously. We didn't have the terminology and the concepts, the understanding that we have today. And so it was all just a bunch of pseudo-philosophizing or vague biologism, as far as the critics were concerned. No one wanted to hear about it. It was all just nonsense. Ring any bells? <laughs> Ring any bells to anyone? Let me offer a few Steinbeck words on this subject of not listening. Because that's really what it was, non-listening. Steinbeck wrote at one point, it's interesting to me that so many of my critics, instead of making observations, are led to bring charges. It is not observed that I find it valid to understand man as an animal before I am prepared to know him as man. It is charged that I have somehow outraged members of my species by considering them part of a species at all. And how often the special pleaders use my work as a distorted echo chamber for their own ideas. Now, observation is the key word here. For a writer whose mind worked largely along the procedures of science, and whose work often concerns itself with the act of seeing and with perspective, it seemed a peculiar trait of the critics 
to make judgments so often without looking very carefully at what it is they were judging. I think that's a profound point. The critics didn't want to listen. They didn't want to really take it seriously, what he was saying. They wanted to superimpose their own agendas and their own ideas, and in some cases ideologies, upon Steinbeck. And if he failed their litmus test, then obviously he was no good. They didn't look very carefully at that which they are judging. That ought to be the first order of business of any critic, wouldn't you think? Just to pay very close attention to that which you, which you are criticizing. I love that quote. All right. Now we get to the final one. The granddaddy of them all, it seems to me. Of all the criticisms, the politics. This is maybe the strongest, the most uh, longest lasting, and most controversial, perhaps. And I am somewhat of a mixed mind myself, um, being a creature of the 1960s, and of the period of the Vietnam War, and the anti-war sentiments that I was part of growing up. Um, I wrestled with this, in the case of Steinbeck. But I want to try to outline for you the squeeze that he found himself in. Totally unfair, I think. And it was put on him for his politics or lack thereof. <laughs> Just note for a second how bizarre and, and myopically irrational it is for a critic to adopt an almost exclusive political approach to literature and to the practice of criticism. If all of your judgments are somehow based on political grounds, it's incredibly irrational, incredibly limiting as a critic. I just throw that in as a parenthetical note. All right, so Steinbeck found himself betwixt and between the conservatives on the one hand and the progressive liberals on the other. So let's go back to the conservatives and back to the days of Grapes of Wrath, uh, Indubious Battle, and that which is followed in the aftermath. The Central Valley Farmers and Farm Owners, the Associated Farmers Organization, there were some people in California or in Oklahoma, who, of course, screamed, liar, 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 you know, liar, pants on fire, right? The uh, depiction that you've given of this, this reality of uh, grapes and wrath is completely false. A false portrait of farm life and of work in a rural environment. Steinbeck, for the conservatives, was too down on capitalism and the ownership class. They thought he was a Marxist communist, as we know, the House Un-American Activities uh, Committee uh, investigated a number of writers and they, they kept after Steinbeck for a while. I don't think he ever had to give direct testimony before McCarthy's committee, but uh, he was on their list. From the 1940s on, the FBI kept, FBI kept a regular file on him. Um, in fact, in World War II, he wanted to serve in the Army and made several overtures for application, but because of the background checks that had been done on him, concluding that he had a subversive tendency, he was denied. He was denied entry into the army. Again, as I say, he was perceived as a Marxist because of his support for <coughs> unions, for the struggles of laborers, how he always stood behind the common person, the working person, as opposed to big exploitative corporations or governments like agribusinesses, for example. This sort of qualified him from the conservative standpoint as um, someone leaning toward Marxism, communism. The right never forgave him for being this perceived Marxist. The political right, of course, had a mouthpiece. For example, a conservative-leaning, uh, scornful, popular press like Time Magazine, for example. Time Magazine never once gave Steinbeck or his works a favorable review. Not once. Now, was this because Henry Luce was the editor and publisher? Well, you can draw your own conclusions, but uh, never, never. Uh, amazing. All right, so that's the conservative side. Now, let's go to the liberal side, the liberal progressive side, some of whom were Marxist-leaning people. They loved Steinbeck, of course, for Grapes of Wrath, for his novel In Dubious Battle, for Of Mice and Men, who was great. 
because they felt as though they could perhaps co-opt Steinbeck for their cause, so to speak. He was one of us. But when Steinbeck turned away from, for example, the Grapes of Wrath phenomenon, and by the way, as we know, he had no choice. He had to turn away. The amount of hatred and hostility, including at home in Salinas and in Monterey, the death threats, the, the castigating of him, both publicly and in writing, um, it was just incredible, uh, even in his home community. I mean, he had to turn away. He had to move in some other direction. He restricted himself. He got very private uh, with his first wife, uh, tried to maintain no contact with the outside world if he could help it. Uh, but he had to do this also for his, the sake of his integrity as an artist. But once he began to turn away, and once he got to works like Cannery Row in 1945, this is where the critical reception began its major turn against him. Followed, of course, by the pearl, that the moon is down, we can go on and name another number of others, but these critics then became vicious in the manner in which they turned on him. Called him a traitor, traitor to the cause. He had turned his back on regular folk, on the struggle, on revolution. And, of course, these little progressives were aided and abetted by a snobbish disdain from the East Coast liberal intellectual journals and magazines like the New Republic and the New York Times Book Review. They regularly lashed out and loaded up their criticism against Steinbeck. Mary McCarthy, <coughs> whose name will be familiar to some of you, who had certain Marxist leanings, wrote in The Nation that if a writer deals in any way, shape, or form with the labor struggles, it must be, by definition, a Marxist track. <laughs> must be. Well, Steinbeck failed her test. This condemnation persisted throughout the late 40s, the 50s, and 60s, all the way up to, of course, the period of the Vietnam War, when Steinbeck was, was living here and in New York City. Uh, the Vietnam period was uh, a low point in liberal regard for Steinbeck and a high watermark of really vicious political criticism. Here's where it gets a little bit complicated. Steinbeck was a, a great supporter and friend of LBJ. He wrote some speeches for him. There's a whole lot of interesting camaraderie between the two of them. Big burly guys, rural fellows. Their wives at the time had grown up as friends together in Texas. There were all sorts of reasons why. But I, I think philosophically and politically, Steinbeck had an affinity for LBJ. Steinbeck went to Vietnam himself to visit his sons and to cover the war as a correspondent, he wrote to Newsday here on Long Island a whole series called Letters to Alicia, a total of 58 entries, uh, as a correspondent there. And by the way, he put himself in harm's way on many occasions, just as he had done in World War II when he went on to the front lines as a war correspondent published, uh, collected and published as a book called Once There Was a War, came out in 1958. So Steinbeck was initially quite hawkish about Vietnam and the Red Scare. He was a staunch anti-communist. At Truman's request, he had made a visit to the Soviet Union and was absolutely appalled by the attacks on individual freedom. At this particular time, Steinbeck became an anti-collectivist and very much uh, a supporter of the autonomy of the individual and the absolute paramount importance of the freedom of the individual person. There's a big question, of course, that looms over whether or not Steinbeck began to change his mind about the Vietnam War as it went further and after he was actually there to visit and be on the front lines and see what was going on. A um, good friend of mine, Tom Barden, has uh, in recent years collected all of those Newsday entries into a book that the University of Virginia Press put out a few years ago called Steinbeck in Vietnam. It's got all the letters. You can read them from beginning to end. And he's got wonderful commentary at the beginning and an afterward, which uh, suggests that there was a drift in Steinbeck's thinking. Initially, uh, he, was, he was not so sure that we ought to be involved. 
And then he became quite hawkish. At the time when he was writing almost all of these letters to Alicia, he was very much a supporter. But then again, after having been there, he began to sort of ease off. However, unfortunately, when he came back from that war, when he returned in 1967, he was a broken man. He was extremely ill. And uh, as Elaine, his, uh, his widow, proclaimed, she uh, said, from what I've read uh, on a number of occasions, that he had changed his mind profoundly. And yet, he never really had the opportunity to express it. He never could write it down. He was just basically too ill. So, my points regarding Steinbeck and politics, and then we're going to wrap this up here very shortly. Number one, the Marxists had the goal to make Steinbeck out to be a Marxist, which he never was, and then accuse him of betraying that which they had falsely made, falsely made him out to be. Two, Steinbeck stated in a number of places that in works like Grapes of Wrath, and Mice and Men, and Dubious Battle, etc., he said, I was simply writing about people, about the struggles, the hardships, the aspirations, the desperation of people. I was not writing so as to promote a political ideology or a political theory. Three, throughout his life, Steinbeck was largely apolitical, particularly in his writings. Four, critics from every side and from every angle actually paid very little attention, as we said before, to what Steinbeck was actually saying in his works, instead insisting on what he should be saying or ought to be saying, according to their terms. I consider this an article of bad faith on the part of many critics. And indeed, it's a red herring. You know, that's an informal fallacy. We've become very accustomed to red herrings in the last couple of years, where the idea is to divert the discussion, to obscure it, right, to swift, switch the topic. So instead of actually paying attention to what Steinbeck was writing and really trying to figure it out and comment on it, just switch the topic and talk about some abstract political ideology. I could go on to cite examples from The Moon is Down and uh, Cannery Road and so forth, but I'll skip over them for the moment. What I would like to make a claim about is that Steinbeck underwent, in the course of his life, a philosophical evolution, culminating in his last novel, written right here in Winter of Our Discontent, right here in Sag Harbor, uh, it's thinly veiled, even though he said these are all fictional characters, and you know, I just I make it up, don't, don't try to make any connections, well, fat chance of that, right? Um, but he had undergone a significant philosophical evolution. He had moved away from sort of group mentality uh, that we would find, say, with grapes and bread. And in Winter of Our Discontent, Ethan Allen Hawley represents the sort of the lone, moral individual struggling to be morally accountable and responsible and to do the right thing. He switched his emphasis, morally speaking, away from the large group and placed it squarely on the individual. But again, the critics, the commentators, they didn't want to have a brush with that at all. They didn't pay any attention. All right, so conclusions, conclusions. What about the catch-22 of all of this? The futility, the trap, the squeeze. I'll try to just put it in a few words and then wrap up. So, number one. Steinbeck finds himself caught between the political left and the political right and reviled by both. Right? He was not liberal enough for the left, and he was far too liberal for the right, and he couldn't win no matter which way he went. Number two, he was told that he should remain a California writer, because that's what he knew. But be aware, Steinbeck, that there's no grade A California literature that's possible. So you could disqualify yourself from the upper ranks of major writers. Three, you should be serious and you should be sophisticated and almost elite by university standards, but please, please, Steinbeck, don't be a philosopher, and especially a biologist slash ecologist type philosopher. We don't want you to be that, because it doesn't make any sense. Four, Steinbeck, your compassion for the little guy is wonderful, it's great, very moving and so forth, but don't get too emotional, don't be sentimental about it. Be objective. Well, of course, Steinbeck was objective. That's something people don't realize. Of Mice and Men is a strange little book because it's, it's, it, uh, it appeals to the heartstrings, but it's an objective telling of the story. Right? 
and just reporting like a reporter would. That drove people crazy. The original proposed title for of Mice and Men, the original title we wanted was something that happened. Something that happened. So it wouldn't have made the bestseller list maybe with that title, but. All right, five. Steinbeck, your moral sensibilities and Grapes of Wrath and of Mice and Man and other such works are quite laudable, but please don't appear to be a moralist. Right, as you did in Winter of Our Discontent and The Moon is Down. And lastly, Steinbeck, you should write what's in your blood. You should continue to be the one trick pony from California because that's what you really understand from the way you were raised. You should not even pretend to be more of a globalist, that is to say, having more universal, widespread appeal. But we're going to continue to condemn you for being a regional right. So, in all of these ways, and probably many more, he's caught betwixt and between, it seems to me. He's in a terrible kind of paradox, uh, a catch-22 from which he was never really able to extricate himself. So, conclusion, in the end, why is the writer so beloved, why is Steinbeck the writer so beloved by so many in the face of all of this adversity, bias, deliberate misunderstanding? Why is he still so important, so relevant, to our times, to all times, I believe, and all places. I'll give a number of reasons. Number one, in his very best work, he wrote really, really well. He was a beautiful, beautiful writer. His stories are so memorable. Think about the Jobs and Grapes of Wrath, or George and Lenny and Mice and Men, Mac and the Boys, and you can recite any number of examples. You read these works, they get into your consciousness, and they don't leave you. It's one of the marks of the great writer is to write stories that are so memorable that they become almost part of the folklore, part of the literature of the culture. That's one reason. Two, and I mentioned this before with Jack Benson, his biographer, the secret to his enduring appeal all over the world is really quite simple. He cared about people and he wanted to tell their stories. And he wanted to improve the human condition, as well as the condition of the world overall. This was brought to bear uh, in a conversation that I had in my first trip to Japan when I gave a talk at the Steinbeck conference, and we were sitting around in a hotel room at the end of the day's meeting, and uh, a number of Japanese colleagues were there, and they were sipping some nice Japanese wine and so forth, and I asked them the question, you know, why do you folks, I mean, after all, John Steinbeck, I mean, he's not exactly part of your culture, I mean, why do you find him so appealing? And almost to a person, they said things like, because he really cares about people, and because he loves nature, and he wants the human situation to be better. That's what they said, almost everyone. It's incredible. Three, he obviously had some very important things to say that we ought to pay attention to. Ecology being perhaps at the high mark, man living in harmony with nature, an acceptance of a reality, acceptance of our place in nature, getting away from this sort of uh, arrogant hubris, right, where we are the dominating species, we control the whole action. No, that's, we're just one cog in the machine, as far as Steinbeck is concerned. People should have listened very seriously to that, and should still be listening very seriously today. Second point, moral responsibility. The individual points of light that he brings out in the winter of our discontent toward the end. How could that not be terribly, terribly important? Also, everything being a matter of perspective, how you see it, the lens through which you see. And if you switch the lenses, you see something entirely differently, right? The prologue to Cannery Row is absolutely beautiful in that regard, right? When he's describing the pimps and the horrors and the drunks and the Mac and the boys and all that. Looked at through a certain prism, but then if you looked at through another prism, it would be entirely different. Instead of sinners, they would be saints, right? The notion of perspective is really an incredible achievement in his work. Being true to oneself, no matter what, no matter the adversity and the misunderstanding, stick to your guns, be true to yourself. And also, I would also say that uh, on many occasions, several occasions, he spoke about the infinite perfectibility of man. Now, he didn't think we would ever get there. <laughs> We're never going to be perfect, but we can make progress. 
There is a kind of infinite perfectibility that lies within our potential, within our grasp. And that's, uh, that's not a cynical point of view. That's exactly the opposite of it. All right, so Steinbeck has left us with some huge questions and huge challenges even 50 years later after his passing in 1968. And I think it's summed up rather nicely in his last novel, The Witcher of Our Discontent, which I would suggest that people reread and don't get caught up in, in the language. I mean, he's, he's, he's cute. He's doing all kinds of tricks and linguistic gimmicks and stuff. And some of my colleagues of mine love very much. They get all hung up in that. Oh, it's not the same writer as it was. Forget about it. Just read it as a prescient statement about where America was at in the 50s and 60s and where it was heading on into the future. Now, we're 50 years later. And you can ask yourself the question once you've read Winter of Our Discontent again through these lenses, through that lens, you can ask yourself, whoa, is he talking about our reality today? Is this what America has become? It's a predictive tale of America's future. Prior to the Winter of Our Discontent, Steinbeck had written a letter to Adlai Stevenson, who was another of his favorites, in which he observed an observation about American society. And in this letter he wrote, quote, there is a creeping, all-pervading nerve gas of immorality which starts in the nursery and does not stop before it reaches the highest offices, both corporate and government. So I would say, on this 50-year anniversary occasion, I'm sorry that I've gone a little bit longer than I intended, but uh, I'd say, John Steinbeck, job well done. Your legacy endures. You're relevant. And you're needed now perhaps more than ever. If people would just listen to you and read you and take you seriously and explore the ramifications of your ideas and of the struggles of your characters, you're needed more now than perhaps ever. I would say that we, we thank you and that we salute you and I would hope that maybe that portion of his ashes that are floating around, perhaps still in the Pacific Sea off of Point Lobos, and the other portion of his ashes that are in the Garden of Memories Cemetery in the Hamilton family plot in California, that all of this would entail that his soul could rest in peace. Thank you very much. Ten minutes uh, less time, but anyway, I, it's done now. <laughs> we can't we can't reverse it. But let's talk. Let's let's have some comments or questions. Uh, was he broken by um, all of this? Uh, you know, he was was his spirit broken? Yeah, I don't mean completely, but I mean yeah. battered. Yeah. Did he die prematurely? I mean, that early. Yeah, he had a lot of a lot of medical issues. In fact, uh, in that period of time that he spent in Southeast Asia, uh, in addition to Vietnam, he went to places like Indonesia and Japan and so forth. He suffered a serious back injury in Japan. Interesting story, and it's been documented in several places. He was helping, he was walking down the street apparently, and a guy down in the basement was trying to bring cases of beer up these steps. And he went down and he, and he sort of reached and helped this guy, and he got a serious back injury from that. So. Medically, he was really spiraling downhill, even though he was only 66 when he died. Uh, he was going downhill quite a bit. But as far as his spirit is concerned, um, after, for example, that, uh, that just awful condemning editorial in the New York Times following the, New York, following the Nobel Prize, he never wrote another word of fiction. No more fiction. Arthur Meisner, I think, was the op-ed guy there, but no, no more fiction. I'd just like to tell everyone in this room that you could be very thankful for John because when they built the new uh, road along Long Beach, it, that's all filled what you drive on. And the road where you park was the original road. When they put the fill in, it was John who said to our mayor at the time, Johnny Ward, that we need to do a culvert underneath to put flow because it used to flow over the water, 
So the <coughs> it, uh, flushed out the bay, the inner bays. So we could be very thankful to John that we got a culvert there, though I don't say it does enough flushing. <laughs> but anyhow, it was absolutely his statement that brought this up at, anyhow, gathering. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. I know a man named Ben Manek. Ben Manek lived about eight houses down the road here. And uh, he used to fish with John. And uh, because he had a better boat and better liquor. <laughs> and they take John out. Which one had the better boat and liquor? John. Oh, John. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and he had, his house is a peninsula. And uh, so he'd take him out. And uh, Benny would say, oh, let me, let me put the bait on there for you, John. John never caught a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and one day he figured out why. Because... Ben wasn't putting anything on his hook. He said, John, you never catch a fish anyhow. And the other time was when Benny was in the black buoy. And this guy came at him, very self-important. And he said, oh, there he is. And Benny says, where are you going? He says, that's John Steinbeck. That guy? No, no, that's Marty. No, no, John Steinbeck. This bar is much too dangerous. You get my point? Yeah. He walked the guy out the door. That was the most dangerous bar in It's called the Black Fooey. It's on Main Street. And anyone who's a local would tell you. And Steinbeck would occasionally frequent that. And John would talk like this when somebody was in it. About your fishing story, I have a feeling that if you did catch a fish, you would throw it back. And that points up something very interesting to me as the uh, contrast between, say, Steinbeck and Hemingway and Ernest Hemingway. You know, they were major writers at the same time, right? Um, and Hemingway's a fabulous writer. I mean, he's a tremendous stylist, had a tremendous impact in the academic world upon literary scholars and the like. But you couldn't have two men who were so diametrically different and opposed to one another in their sensibilities, in their concerns. And uh, Hemingway would have never thrown the fish back. In fact, he'd have gone out to get a you know as you were talking, big dolphin or something. I was I was thinking all of those points that you have on the board. I've read a lot about Mark Twain. Yeah, that's Mark Twain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. every point. And the, the writers, the high mucky mucks of the day, he made fun of them. Yeah. He would do public speaking where, I can't remember who it was that he made fun of, but. Twain would. Twain. Twain. Who Twain was making fun of, but he didn't have a speaking engagement for about six months. <laughs> they were blacklisted. I think there's a growing recognition. But he was too popular. Yeah. There's a growing recognition, I think, uh, along the lines of what you're just saying, that. That Twain and Steinbeck were brethren yeah. in many ways. That Steinbeck was almost the, the natural follow up to yeah. Twain. Yes, I was probably so naive, but um, after getting the Nobel Prize, and then an article comes out in the op ed that's so scathing, how do they keep justifying that the guy is not a great writer? That he's not a great writer? Yeah, I mean, He's won a Nobel Prize. He's sold, right? He's won every major literary prize that you can imagine. It just, at one point, it doesn't break. They still were against him. A lot were, yes. As unfathomable as that may seem, right? Many could not be persuaded. He did not win the Nobel Prize for a single work Correct. of fiction. He won it for his body of works. I thought the winners all had a one selection that they picked, but they did not pick. They picked his body of work for the reason for the award. This is true, however, as you probably know, when the Nobel chairperson of the committee was making the announcement to make the award, they actually cited Winter of our discontent, which had been his most recent novel, but he actually cited it and pointed it out as, as an exemplar of his feelings for human beings, his moral sensibility, 
as a kind of highlight. Not necessarily because it was his best work, but you're right, though, that the award is supposed to be given for the body of work. If you consider the whole body, I don't know how anybody could, could write something like that in the New York Times. But Yes? I'm a, a great fan of Steinbeck's. Actually, the first time I heard the word Sag Harbor was when I went travels with Charlie at 13. Yeah. I remember being insulted. It went around New York City rather than through it. Uh, and I, I didn't know he was unpopular with the critics until seeing the Terrence McNally film. You know, Terrence McNally worked with Steinbeck, uh, and he pointed that out. And, and what you're, it's very interesting you're saying this, because I love Mark Twain, I love John Steinbeck, and I think of them as sort of open in a way that, that, that Hemingway, I've, I've never liked the people who like Hemingway. <laughs> you know, this kind of masculine purity, this, this way of looking. You don't go fishing with him, huh? No, no. And, and, and it's, there's a kind of also masculinity is, is involved with that. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, that, that, uh, you know, Steinbeck and Mark Twain have this looseness and openness, like Walt Whitman, of uh, embracing yeah. the masses and a feminine side. Uh, is that part of the philosophical? Because I'm very new to this criticism. I had no idea he was not, not liked. I, I love him. Chris of Wrath just changed me. Oh, absolutely. So is that as it did hundreds of thousands of Yeah, just, just, I'm another years. just slob like everyone else, I guess. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> no, but I think you point out an interesting kind of irony, also, with regard to Steinbeck. Uh, I never met him, so those of you who saw him would, would probably recognize him. He's a big guy, a burly fellow, a husky kind of a strong guy. You know, he, he, he loved gadgets and working with his hands and... Farm. I mean, he's a, a, a man, you know, like, but not, not a macho right. fellow like, like Hemingway, anyway, like right? There was right. more of an acceptance, more of an inner sensitivity right. to Steinbeck than I think ever existed in Hemingway. Hemingway would have probably admitted it. I mean, that this wasn't his thing, right? Jack Benson, the uh, uh, biographer of, of Steinbeck, has this wonderful book. I don't know if I brought it with me. It's called Chasing Steinbeck's Ghost. And he tells about times that he spent out here in St. Harbor after he'd written the biography, and he kind of wrote a book about the writing of the biography. Anyway, in the, in the final chapter, he's, he's comparing Hemingway and Faulkner and Steinbeck, and he makes the claim that to him, and he's an American literature specialist who's been teaching this stuff for years, he makes the claim that neither Hemingway nor Faulkner has a single work in their ovoir that would stand out the way the Graves of Wrath was. None. I mean, they were great writers, and you can pick, you know, certain good works and not so good works, but not, a, not that one masterpiece that lingers in the mind the way Graves of Wrath does. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I'm not a Hemingway expert, so I can't say for sure, but Wasn't yes, ma'am. Hemingway's mother used to dress him, yeah. the little girl dresses. Yeah. And I think uh, what I read is that he had a masculinity problem from this um, transgressing. I mean, I'm not kidding. And, and had to go out of his way to show off some uh, braggadocia. When you get into the depths of psychology and one's upbringing, it raises a lot of interesting points. But connected to that, I mean, let's consider that. Um, all right. Uh, there's a large story to be told about Steinbeck and women. Right, there's a big, big story to be told there. I'm kind of in the midst of it now, and there's all kinds of controversy, legal and otherwise, about this this book that uh, has, has recently maybe been released, although no one's quite sure yet whether it will ultimately be released, written by his second wife, Gwen. And it's a very damning book, a very condemning sort of book about Steinbeck the man. But... It's very strange because it was based on a series of interviews and nobody's sure who actually edited the interviews or whether they really reflected what Gwynn had actually said on the tape. But anyway, it's a very complex story. But let's consider the fact that Steinbeck was surrounded by women as, as a kid. He had three sisters and a very dominant mother, very, very intelligent school teacher. Uh, he had an aunt who was the one that, uh, that gave him, I think at the age of nine, his copy of uh, Sir Lancelot and the Knights of the Round Table, which made a huge impact. He said, I've, even late in life, I've been reading that ever since I was nine years old. And he was so impressed with chivalry and gallantry and, and that as a way of life. You know, not just sort of idle virtues, but, but that which could be incorporated into your 
very fiber, right? But he was surrounded, and he had three wives. His literary agents were two ladies, right? Uh, his publishing house and lots of women and all. We can go on and on. I mean, there were many, many women uh, with whom he was associated. And you would wonder, you know, what, what sort of an impact that may have had upon him as compared, say, with Hemingway. It's all kind of speculative, but it's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. Yes? Uh, last time I got a phone call from one of the librarians here who asked me if, uh, uh, if I would take a couple to see Steinbeck's house. I, I do historic tours, so I, I know where his house is. So uh, uh, I, I said, well, I said, you know, it, generally, uh, it's not a place that we try to, yes. at least I try to bring people. Right. I don't want to exploit you know, exploited. So she said, well, they're, they're a couple from Denmark. Now, that impressed me. Not because they were from Denmark, but because 50 years after his death, <laughs> they didn't come to the United States just to visit Steinbeck's house. Well, the people you were taking around was a couple from Denmark. Denmark, yes. Yeah. People, I would think, uh, you didn't. I didn't say that, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't, I said, <coughs> I said to the librarian, I said, do you get many requests still from, you know, visit Steinbeck's house? She said, I do. She said, I get a few every year who still, when they come to say Carver, oh, they, they don't come, you know, they don't come to see the Bay or they, they come to, to, to visit John Steinbeck's house. And that got kind of an impact after 50 years. Absolutely. Uh, it shows, you know, uh, uh, he must have been doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a modest little house. I mean, let me bring up a little bit about that. Um, I, all right, I'll say it. My husband and I were Don's best friends in Sag Harbor. And uh, going back, first of all, we always have to misdirect people as to where John was. <laughs> Secondly, at this point, it's a, a very touchy situation regarding his house because Elaine, his wife's family, well, sister, it was left to sister. Anyhow, it's a whole other element. The, as far as I'm concerned, I feel that the writing uh, is that is what should be preserved as for the village of Sag Harbor. And there has been appointment, I said to the Historical Society, why don't you get first refusal or something. And I know there is a little bit of interest in the village uh, regarding that and whether it could be moved to the John Steinbeck Park and so on. Now it's spreading great rumors. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to add one other thing. When you talk about gadgets, I'll never forget the day. Remember when we had that thing you squeezed and it punches out? punched out different letters. Mm -hmm. John got always the first the first things that would be coming out on the market. And I walk in the house and he hands me this. He says, God, I look at this. <laughs> punch up such something about labeling. You know, a the label machine. The yeah. label machine. Yeah. All right, what do you label? Okay. <laughs> and yet one of his favorite gadgets would have just been a simple number two headed pencil. Yeah. Right. Right? Uh, and he had a yellow pen. There still he wrote like long pencil, so. He yeah. did. He wrote longhand, largely, yeah. and yeah. just a simple pad. And he loved his, apparently he would get up in the morning and sharpen his pencils. Yeah. He had a whole stack on his writing desk of pencils that were just uh, recently sharpened, ready to go. Well, yes. and it there's, a, like, there's a story about uh, Grapes of Wrath where somebody said, you know, you know, this folk singer, Woody Guthrie, wrote this song. It's called The Ballad of Tom Joad. Yeah. He says, I know about it. That little bastard. <laughs> Put in two songs what it took me four years to write. I should have been a folk singer. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. <laughs> and of course, in our day, where Springsteen has picked up on the, uh, the Joads, right? Yes. Ballad of Tom Joad. I think he has his version of it, right? Who was that? Bruce, 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 Bruce. He did that Bruce. because I've worked with Pete Seeger for about 24 years, and he did that because that's one of the songs. The name of the album is called, is called um, Songs from Pete, I believe. And he had to call Pete and negotiate with Pete. To, right. There's another one. 
he hated publicity. He would call up magazines and say, don't ever put my picture on the cover of your magazine again. <laughs> <laughs> I heard an argument with the person from Sing Out. And Sing Out magazine was started by Pete and a few other people. Because they would get more copies sold of Pete's picture. Was Absolutely. The non-publicity hounds are a lost species now, aren't they? Huh? Dying breed. Yeah. I've got up on the table here 20 Steinbeck books. You're welcome to take any ones that you would like. Uh, you may not have read some of them, but uh, I've collected them over time, and I wanted to donate them to the library and the, uh, to you folks. Thank you. Thanks to your daughter, right? Yes, my daughter's on the library board. <laughs> It's wonderful to hear these conversations. How did you get so involved as a philosopher? You know, I was asked that question uh, when I first arrived, and one of the first persons that came asked me, well, how did a philosopher get interested? You know, I, as I best recall, I grew up out in the Midwest, in the rural Midwest, and I think at my rural high school or middle school, we probably read of mice and men, as I can recall, but it made, I mean, I liked it, but it didn't make much of an impression. And I didn't pay any attention to Steinbeck through college. I was a political science and philosophy major. I wanted to become a famous trial attorney like Perry Mason. <laughs> that was my great aspiration. But uh, the war, the, the Vietnam War, Steinbeck and I would have reacted a little differently. I guess it kind of crippled my notion of being an establishment person and a lawyer and all of that. But uh, anyway, so flash forward to probably uh, the early 1980s. And uh, this is my wife, Diane, here. Her brother was living in San Francisco at the time. And we went out for a visit with him. And I think after running around town without a car and all that, one day he said, take my car, and because I have to work, just take the car and just run around, you know, go down to, uh, you know, Carmel or somewhere like that, you know, and just, just hang out. So we took the car and we drove down to, to that, uh, what was that, the 19-mile drive or something? Yeah. 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 Great Estates. Yeah. Ended up in Carmel and spent a... Uh, Lovely evening at a bed and breakfast, right by the sea, actually, right by uh, you know, famous, what's the famous golf course? Pebble Beach. Beach. Yeah, right. Yeah. Too, right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the proprietor must have found out, maybe because we filled out a form or something, that I was a professor. And the next morning at breakfast, I recall, she said something to me like, "Well, you're a professor. You probably are familiar with uh, one of our favorite sons, maybe our most favorite son out here in the city. Of course, he wasn't always a favorite <laughs> by any means." They ran him out of town, really. Uh, and I said, well, who? And she said, John Steinbeck. I said, well, yeah, right. And then I made the connection with where we were geographically. To make a long story short, we got back to the San Francisco airport. And uh, before getting on the plane, I purchased a copy, a real cheap paperback copy of Cannery Row. Had it read by the time we got back to New York. And I was sold. <laughs> I said to myself, 20 or 30 pages in, I said, man, this, this is a writer not like I've ever experienced in America before. And, and I really loved his ideas. I loved his, the, the penetrating symbols and uh, the allegories and, uh, you know, not just the simple telling of, the way he could celebrate Mac and the boys, for example. And uh, it was just amazing. You know, not many people would have the courage to do that. Right? Anyway, that's that was it. And that just took off from there, and I wrote a few things, and spoke at some conferences, and Steinbeck's been very good to me, because I've been able to travel to a dozen different foreign countries and speak at conferences on Steinbeck, as well as my beloved Sag Harbor here. This is, this is the best to become here, and I'm really encouraged to hear that, you know, really, I mean, Steinbeck was amazing. I mean, he was astonishing. And he deserves a lot more credit than he was ever awarded, even though he won every major award there is. <laughs> and it would be lovely to see a place like St. Harbor, where, by all accounts, he really loved living there in the final years of his life. And whatever the community could do to promote and celebrate, and, and, and you know, Steinbeck, I think, would just be fabulous. They've done a pretty good job out in Salinas. By the way, if you visit, if you visit his, his home where he was born, you can actually see the room up in front of the house where he was in the cradle and was born there at the house. But if you check the logbook of visitors, right from where they come all over the world, 
hundreds and hundreds of visitors to the music sign there's birthplace. And then you can take the tour around around the town like, like you do. And we did that a couple of times. It's a lot of fun. I mean, Seacob not only uh, embraced Steinbeck, they protected him in, yes. in, in many ways. Yes, people here in Saigon oh, yeah. protected oh, yeah. his privacy. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And still do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would imagine when Elaine was still with us, she probably would have insisted on a good bit of that. Am I right? The, oh, absolutely. The, the privacy yeah. aspect. 100%. It's a shame, of course, as you were alluding to, that um, there was all sorts of legal problems and issues with the Steinbeck estate and people wanting to lay claim to, you know, a certain amount of profit, I suppose, and it got to be kind of ugly there for a while. If I understand correctly, the, the house here has been sold, right? It, it's in private hands now? No, it's a relative of, of yeah. Jean's oh, it's, nephew. It's a relative that has taken possession. Yeah, and some of it has been The apartment, the apartment in New York at least 72nd has been sold. It's probably sold. Yeah. Yeah. I was told by I, I, I read something somewhere, maybe in the New York Times or whatever, that when the apartment was sold and it was tied up for a long time, they, they, because of the legal problems with the estate, they couldn't just sell it. But I certainly have a distinct impression that when the buyers came into the house, it was just like it was when he left. I mean, his writing, his little writing room was just like it was, right? And the thing hadn't really wanted to change that very much. Yeah, very big carpet. I'm sorry? <laughs> it had a very thick carpet <coughs> years ago. Yes, please. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm at the custom house and I get requests from people who want to know where he, you know, where he lives. Right down the block here. Yeah, and I think the big thing, if anything could be preserved, would be the gazebo. Oh, uh, yeah, so yeah. 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 So that's why. If you can't get into the house, make sure you can get into the gazebo. Join us, Carl. Join us, Carl. That would be great. I thought that it was still there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, still, it's, still, yeah, it's still there. It's still on the property. It was somebody else's hand, too. Yes, please. Uh, I have a personal letter that was written to me by Elaine Steinbeck when I was about 15, when he passed away, and I thought maybe you might want me to read it. Yes, please. Oh, yes. It was... Um, please. It was, this would be 1968? 1968. And it was about the words that were said at his funeral. So it, I don't have my glasses on, so if I don't read correctly... You want to borrow? <laughs> <are they magnets? laughs> um, right in the ring of words when the right man rings them. Fair the fall of songs when the singer sings them. Still they are caroled and said. O oh, wings, they are carried after the singer is dead and the maker buried. Dear Jackie, this lovely R.L. Stevenson poem was read at my beloved John's funeral, and I would like to share it with you. It was so sweet of you to write to me and to share this grief and loss. Yes, I have always thought of you as our friend, and I am glad you are. The important thing is please remember John Steinbeck with love, Elaine Steinbeck. Oh, thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. I would say something else there about the funeral. Elaine, his wife, was very upset. It was, there weren't that many of us there, and it was astounding and surprised that so few people turned up for the funeral. St. James Episcopal Church, right? And at the church, church. yeah. It was, she said, do remember him. You must remember him. And now, 50 years later, or whatever, I mean, then first the stamp came out yes. at a point. Uh, the anniversary and so on, the, the country is embracing him more, but not at the time of his funeral. And she was really very upsetting. All of us, we were amazed. I don't think we can overstate just how relevant and how important Steinbeck's uh, work is and his ideas for our, our times and for all times for that matter. That's the mark of a great writer, it seems to me, and, and that's why he's not just a regionalist. He can write about, you know, pimps and, and drunks and so forth in, in a little town in California. But it had universal significance. All your statements, people can relate to it. I think that your lecture was excellent. It hits all the points beautifully, Thank as you. far as my knowledge of John goes. You have, have first-hand knowledge. Yeah.
I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, you'll correct me, but uh, the, the Stevenson poem was read by Henry Fonda, I think. Uh, okay, well, I'm not sure. I think it was read by Henry Fonda, if I'm not mistaken. Who had appeared in, in the film version of Birds of Rap. That's right. By the way, when the letter was addressed to me, it was just addressed to Jackie Worth, care of my mother, just with no last name and no address, but just San Harbor, New York. So that's how it was years ago. Oh, oh, that's wonderful. You're so lucky. Yes. Um, before everyone leaves, I just want to say thank you to Mr. Edwards and Susan Edwards for the donation of the books to the library. And if any of you manage to travel with any of them, if you can send us a postcard or an email from where the books have visited. A little bit like Travels with Charlie, so I implore you to go and peruse the table at the front and to borrow a book. And we're also taking um, oral history. Sorry. Yeah, so um, one of the things that was amazing about this lecture is the amount of people who have these personal memories. But remember that it's been 50 years since he passed away, and 50 years from now we're not going to have these conversations. So if any of you have personal memories or know someone with personal memories of Steinbecker's family, please contact the library. We would love to interview you. And then everybody will know these stories forever. <laughs>